Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Chris Defonso. I'm the field crops entomologist with Michigan State University. And uh, Pat, go ahead. Well, I'm Pat Porter, extension entomologist in uh, West Texas. Okay, well, uh, Andy Michael from Ohio State asked us to do this talk for you guys. And Pat is literally sitting in Texas and I'm sitting in Michigan and Pat is controlling the, the slide deck here. So I will ask him to advance. And uh, the outline of the talk here was sort of provided by, and by uh, Andy based on what you might like to know about the efficacy of BT corn. So we're sort of following his outline, but I promise we will bring this back from Texas and Michigan to Ohio. We're going to be discussing resistance evolution in this talk. And people in the audience are probably saying, how did this happen so fast? It's only been 25 years since we got BT corn. And, and that's true if you're thinking in human terms in the passage of time. But the truth is our first BT toxins are actually quite long in the tooth. And back when I was a kid, we used to laugh. We'd watch Lawrence Welk on black and white TV and he sold Geritol, a tonic for elderly people that was uh, mostly B vitamins and iron and alcohol. And that was our definition of old. But think about insects. They have, say, a one or two or three generations a year. And, and in those terms, Western bean cutworm, uh, 25 generations of selection on BT, one per year, in our terms is 500 years. That's back at the fall of the Incan Empire. And European corn borer, some of the races have more than one generation a year, takes us back to the Middle Ages. And at the extreme, corn earworm has three generations on BT, two on corn and one on cotton. And at 20 years per generation, that's a, they've been experiencing this selection on BT in our equivalent going back to the fall of the Roman Empire in the West. And so 25 years to us is a very long time for the insects to have to adapt to these toxins. Yeah, so Pat brings up a good point. So in the beginning, 1996, that's 25 years ago. So 2021 will not only be the you know, COVID vaccine, it'll be the 25th year for the commercialization of BT corn. Uh, that first toxin was Cry18AE, and that was for European corn borer control. And from that, you know, now we have more toxins and they're in a whole different smorgasbord of uh, different trait packages that you see here, a very complicated mix, and that has arisen over the last 25 years. Okay, so the first question is, over all that 25 years, what has happened with the resistance of European corn borer? Is there resistance? Well, there's resistance developed in the laboratory, but there's only one case of a field failure, uh, and that is to cry one F, and that is in far northeastern Canada in some of the maritime provinces. And that resistance has occurred in areas with uh, small isolated fields. Now, this is some information from a laboratory bioassay from one of our colleagues, Jocelyn Smith, who works in Ontario. And she's taken the population from, from those maritime provinces, and she's comparing it to a population in Ontario that is not yet resistant. And you see that purple line, that shows uh, the uh, death, the mortality over a range of CRY1F doses from zero to what I've said is a lot. And you can see very rapidly those uh, non-resistant corn borers die in a very low, low dose. That's the corn borer that's marked sort of in a dark purple or, or black. Now compare that to the uh, corn borer population that is from the maritime provinces. And that's along the bottom in the dashed line no matter how much BT you feed it, it will not die. So that is a resistant population that evolved in the field uh, to cry, cry 1F, but it's the only uh, uh, resistance case that we know like that for corn borer. Well, and I'll add, we also have a very similar picture for Southwestern corn borer, which is resistant to cry 1F, in little pockets of Arizona and New Mexico where they have isolated valleys with irrigated corn. and There's no moths coming in and out of those valleys. And that resistance was confirmed about four years ago. Very similar picture. Hmm. 
The second species we are concerned about is the Western bean cutworm. And there is one confirmed case of Bt resistance in that species. So Western bean resistance to Bt corn is similar to that of European corn borer in that it involves the same Bt toxin, the Herculex-1 or Cry1F toxin. But it's different because Cry1F resistance in Western bean didn't occur in an isolated area, but across the corn belt. So cutworm damage to Herculex corn was common in the Great Lakes region in 2016 and 2017. Some of you may have actually had failed fields with a lot of damage. The ear on the left with the quick strip is from an Ohio field with extensive unexpected injury. And that picture was provided by Andy Michael. And damage was also reported in some Western states as well. Eventually lab assays were done and they did um, document the field evolved resistance of this species. And just before the 2018 field season, the registrant of Herculex removed the claim of cutworm control or Western bean cutworm control from its uh, products. And this is the first case of an insect being removed from what is essentially the BT label. Now the third species of interest is corn earworm and Pat is gonna tell you about that. Corn earworm is kind of the same sad story. And uh, this, this shows the progression of resistance since 2016. David Kearns and College Station has been running these every year. And these, this is the resistance ratio greater than 10, the percentage of population with the resistance ratio greater than 10. Or a resistance ratio of 10 means it takes 10 times more toxin to kill that field population than it would a susceptible lab colony. And for the Cry1AC, you can see it went from 40% of the populations with a ratio greater than 10 in 2016. Now we're at 100% by 2020. Cry2 is the same story. Um, and this is all because these toxins are being used and the insects are being selected. Cry1F never did work on airworm very well anyway, so all the data is kind of fuzzy. It doesn't work at all, so it doesn't really matter. And then there's a new new toxin on the block, FIP3A, that we'll get into. It still works just fine on corn earworm. Okay, Pat, now, one, one thing we should point out about earworm is it it's traditionally not a big pest up in our in our area. I mean, the reason Pat is on this talk is that earworms fly north every year. And in the past, we really haven't had that that much trouble with them. But in the last few years, we are starting to see these earworms pop up and kind of become a problem. And, and yeah, we're, we're glad to send you our resistant moths every year, but where it might hurt you, even though it's not a major economic pest of corn, we've got plenty of data from the South that says that tip damage, while not costing yield, lets fungi in, and that can exacerbate your mycotoxin problems, vomitoxin in Canada. And so, yeah, the damage isn't that much, but the fungal risk is higher. And so you, you guys will experience that with our resistant insects. And Andy Michael sent us these slides. This is Ohio 2018, where, where you guys had an outbreak of corn earworm on Cry1AB corn. And they went to the field and, and checked that and confirmed that corn did have Cry1AB. These are test strips of seven ears. And five of the seven ears show two bands. This is the band that says Cry1AB is in that corn, and this is the test band that says the strip's working. So it's, it's very real. Well, so what are the factors that are driving this resistance to Bt corn? So one thing is, of course, 80% of all our corn acres have uh, Bt traits, and all of those acres are selecting for resistance for the pests that are, that are in them. Another thing is that single trait hybrids are still being planted. So single trait hybrids were the original hybrids that were first introduced. Um, again, it was a single, so there was only one toxin, Cry1F or Cry1AB was in, that, um, was in that corn. And if you recall, you had to plant a 20% block refuge. Well, starting in about 2010, those singles were supposed to be phased out and they were supposed to be replaced by pyramids, essentially, two or more toxins kind of py pyramided or stacked together, kind of like a tank mix. 
And the idea of that was to lower the risk of resistance. Instead of one hammer killing the insect, kind of like hitting it with two or three hammers. And, and in return for that tank mix, then your, uh, your, the, the corn that you were purchasing could then be sold as a 5% seed blend. And what was really important was that the singles were supposed to be phased out. So there wasn't continued selection on the singles, only pyramids planted. So again, these singles are supposed to be phased out, but they really weren't, especially in niche markets. For example, the Maritimes of Canada where corn borer became resistant. And I did a, a quick search for the upper peninsula of Michigan, kind of an isolated seed market as well, and immediately found <coughs> some singles listed there in 20, 2021 seed, seed guide. So they still are out there and uh, still selecting individually for populations. Another thing is that, you know, you might think, well, I'll just switch companies and plant a different kind of trait package and I'll be getting different kinds of BTs. And the reality is there's four BT toxins, two of which kind of come together as, as, a, as a set, the cry, cry 1A105 and the Cry2. And all of those are just mixed together within uh, the trait packages of different companies. There's nothing new here. In other words, the, the tank mixes essentially are just the same things over and over again, just with a different name. So the insects are being selected for these, these four toxins. And it doesn't matter if you uh, have a Syngenta type or you, know, you go to Bayer and purchase something different from a, from, from a different company. And, and we're gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about dose because th this matters. And most everyone's heard of the high dose ripping strategy. And this is going to explain that and, and show where it falls apart for these other pests that we're talking about, like Western bean and corn airworm. So let's say there's one gene for resistance. It's got two alleles that make up that gene, one from each parent. And if an insect had susceptible parents, it got those susceptibility alleles, it's still susceptible to the toxin. If one of the parents was resistant or partially resistant, it's got one allele for resistance and one for susceptibility. And if both parents were resistant, it's fully resistant. It's got two alleles for resistance. Now, in a high dose, which is what our BTs were built for initially, for European corn borer and, and a few other pests, it, it was a high dose. It meant that those toxins killed 99.99% of all of the SR insects. It killed all the susceptible and almost, almost all of those that were heterozygous for resistance or had one resistance allele. But the fully resistant still would not be killed. Back when all this started, these genotypes of fully resistant were very, very rare if there were any, there were some SR types out there. But the thought was these rare moths will mate with susceptible moths coming out of the block refuge and all of their offspring are gonna be either SS or SR. There will be no RR. So we thought, well, that'll keep stuff rare for a long time. And we built the original plans for IRM uh, to last about 20 years and pretty much they did. Here's the problem. There are these other pests that are out there. The, originally, they were called secondary pests, where these toxins are not high dose. They leave plenty of these SR types, the heterozygous resistant, alive. And so you can see that when they mate, some of, let's say SR mates with SR, some will be RR, some will be SS, more will be SR. These will not be killed in a, a lower moderate dose environment. So over time, we have built up these resistant populations uh, because the toxins aren't high dose, they're moderate to low dose, and we've let the SRs live. Now we're beginning to inherit that problem. And speaking of inheritance, more work from David Kearns. He's looked at the, some genetic uh, components of resistance and in these older crytoxins. And for cry1ac, so there's more than one gene for resistance, it's polygenic. And these 
uh, alleles are incompletely dominant to completely or nearly completely dominant. And they have an allele frequency of basically 0.5. Now, that means half of the alleles in the whole population are resistance alleles. This toxin's done. Cry 2 is also has multiple types of uh, genes for resistance, and it's incompletely dominant to recessive. recessive. That's a little bit better of a case. But again, the allele frequency now is 0.1. Cry2 doesn't work all that well in corn because the dose is not as high as it is in cotton. And that's why Cry2 and cotton still are relatively effective toxin. Cry1F, as I mentioned, doesn't work anyway on earworm. And here's VIP3A, uh, the new guy on the block. Uh, both parents transmit the allele. So far, we, they've only found one gene for resistance and it's completely recessive, but it's out there uh, at 0.6 per 1,000 insects. And Pat, that so data is, is geared for cotton, correct? But you see that these are similar toxins between corn and cotton. Yeah, I mean, actually these populations weren't, weren't collected off cotton. They were collected off light traps and corn. And so this is what's happening in corn and cotton. The scary thing is they found four more uh, VIP3A resistant families this summer, and he's got them in the lab. And so VIP, VIP resistance is not rare. So let's talk about dose in practical terms. We got European corn borer. I mentioned all of these original toxins were high dose. For European, it killed all, it killed all the heterozygous susceptible, or almost all of them. However, they were moderate or low dose for some other pest species like western bean cutworm, corn earworm, and fall armyworm. And the gray boxes here in the lower part means these toxins were not effective on introduction, and the light green means they were moderate dose, as opposed to dark green, which is high dose. So moderate dose at best. Over time, though. As we've had selection, uh, European corn borer, as Chris mentioned, now is resistant to Cry1F. Western beans resistant to Cry1F. Oh, look, nothing else works on Cry1F, by the way. This is a problem. Earworm has overcome uh, the Cry1s and Cry2s, and fall armyworm is beginning quite significantly to overcome Cry1 and Cry2. So here we are in this low moderate dose selection environment where we're losing control of some of these so-called secondary pests. So Pat, that Cry1F resistance, I should point out though, is only in one place in Canada. That it we is know not, of. It is that, that, yeah, that we've had field failures. It's not quite the same as for our situation in Michigan or Ohio, the Western bee cutworm resistance to Cry1F is widespread. That, that toxin is done essentially. Yeah. So, uh, Another thing driving resistance could be that we're using seed blends rather than block refuge. And this picture of corn is one I took six or seven years ago. I had blue corn adjacent to field corn. I wanted to look at pollen flow. And then I looked at this is the row, the first set refuge row one is the row next to that blue corn. And then I moved out more rows. And you can see that that Blue, blue pollen or the pollen coating for blue moves over quite a bit. Now think of that as a BT. So think of the blue as the BT plant and the, the field yellow corn as non-BT. It's going to get pollen from BT and some of those kernels are going to express toxins, although at a lower dose than would be expressed in the pure blue corn. So remember we talked about high dose and low dose. Now we've got toxins expressed at lower levels than in pure BT. So this ends up being a cafeteria where an insect that gets on the, the seed blend refuge plant is gonna be an environment where it's got kernels with no BT or one toxin rather than the pyramid of three or two toxins or three toxins. And the picture on the right is uh, my intern's rendition of actual field data, which I'm gonna show you now. This is from uh, 2014 and 15 on the left uh, with a Pioneer product called Leptra, which is a combination of three toxins, one of which is VIP. And so we took uh, <clears throat> seed blend ears out of this trial and used those strips on 10 kernels per ear for 10 years. And for the two years combined, 38% of those kernels 
at the tip of the ear had no BT. 27% had one toxin. This is back to a single now. 28% had two toxins and only 8% had all three. That 8% is what you would think is the pyramid. So in these seed blend ears, the pyramid's gone. And, and we call these seed blend refuge ears, but if you look at those data, you'll say, that's not refuge, and it's not. And so in 2019, we, we used uh, Tricepta, which is also a VIP product, with different toxins accompanying VIP 3A. And this is just kind of a diagram. The purple are kernels that had all the toxins, and the green had no toxins, and then the yellow and orange and red are kind of uh, combinations of VIP alone or TRI-1 and TRI-2. So it's the same story. Now, the repercussions of this uh, may have already happened to us with Western bean cutworm. This is a, an efficacy trial that I had in 2010 in the central part of Michigan where Western bean cutworm has, uh, has where the populations are quite high. And this was actually a test uh, of a seed blend versus a non-seed blend. So again, we had very high populations. In our non-BT uh, plots, 82% of the ears were damaged. So that's you know how high that that damage got to. In the Genuity smart stacks that had a 5% block, this is the kind of the old system without a seed blend. If I went into the BT portion of that block, the 95% block, only about a third of the ears were damaged. Now that's kind of not acceptable if you're talking about mycotoxins, but you can see the difference, 82% down to 34% that was doing pretty well. But look at the Genuity smart stacks that was in a seed blend. The only difference here from the previous is that instead of a block of BT with a block of non-BT planted separately, this is just taking that 5% and sprinkling it in there as a seed blend. And the percentage of damaged ears goes back up to 74%. It's essentially not different from a non-BT. So sprinkling those refuge ears inside there, uh, it, 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 it almost is like driving resistance. It's driving damage because Western bean cutworm, uh, there's just a lot of survivors and they move from, from, uh, from, from plant to plant. And once they get, a, get uh, started on some of these non-BT ears, they're able to survive and do, and do damage. So I think that partly what explains some of our issues with Western Maine cutworm and the eventual resistance to Cry1F is that this uh, go, going from a block to a 5% blend. And Chris, I, I should add the uh... Questions around seed blends are still going on, and EPA is proposing to allow seed blends to be planted in the South, seed blends with VIP corn. To their credit, the seed companies are funding research to figure out what in the world's going on. And they funded me this summer. We did a twin trial here in Georgia, just looking at seed blends ability to produce unselected refuge moths. So the science is still open. This is just what we've seen to this point. And we're going to talk about earworm here. Um, it, because it overwinters in the South, and there's three generations of selection on BT, two on corn, and then some of that population moves to BT cotton. So um, really, in the cotton world, we worry about corn earworm because it is the cotton bollworm. It is a devastating pest in cotton. Cotton's not like corn, corn's tough. Cotton, if you feed on a fruit, a, a square or a bowl, the plant drops it off. It just gets rid of it. So a little bit of insect corn earworm feeding on cotton can cost you a lot of your yield. So we're really worried about resistance evolution to VIP, especially in cotton. And this summer, in the trial I mentioned that was sponsored by the seed industry, we looked at the number of moths, corn earworm moths, coming off of corn uh, <coughs> seed blends and block refuges. And in this one 120-acre irrigated field, which is our basic standard field here, we're producing uh, three quarters of a million moths to go out and lay eggs again on corn or on cotton and be selected again. And we've got, well, massive 
corn and cotton maker in Sherlock, Texas, High Plains. So this selection is going on. Corn is the main thing. The next slide will prove that, but it, it's happening on in here in the south on corn earworm, fall armyworm, somewhat European corn borer, and southwestern corn borer. And a little bit western bean cutworm, but that's on the north panhandle of Texas. Here's what I mean about corn being important. Uh, Monsanto did a multi-year study with cooperation from uh, land-grant people and looked at where the moths were coming from in terms of host plant over a season. Yellow is corn. You'll see the times of the year, like in August, almost 100% of the moths in the system came off of corn where they're selected for resistance if they're on BTs. The green is legumes like soybeans and other uh, clovers and things out in, on the field ditches. And <clears throat> red is cotton. So you can see that selection in cotton is not a big deal as far as selection for resistance. Corn is what matters. And that's why the EPA has this, this new plan to help change resistance management in corn especially, and especially about corn earworm. So what traits are left? And we've already answered half that question. For European corn borer, notice Cry1F is green again, because that's when it's all, almost always in the pyramid with these other toxins that still work. So those pyramids work. But for these other pests, some call them secondary pests, uh, we're out of options in terms of older toxins. It, in much of the country, not all of the country, it's still evolving the more we use these, these uh, BTs. That leaves the new guy, that, which works on all these secondary pests and very well, it, it actually doesn't work on European corn borer, but we're not worried about that because the older toxins still work. And it was um, never, it, and, and it was never designed to kill European corn borer, I should point out. That's not a resistance problem. That's because it just doesn't kill corn borer from the very beginning. Yeah. Um, but it kills those other pests very, very right. well. Uh, it's, it, in terms of dose, it's a near high dose. It smokes them. Um, Western bean cutworm, wonderful. Fall army worm, yes. Four deer worm, yes. In fact, I've looked at, at uh, VIP corn now for seven years in the field. I've only found two surviving insects. It's rare to find silk damage in VIP corn. Um, and I've already mentioned that the benefit in addition to not having damage, damaged kernels, well, Earworm's not an economic pest anyway, almost never. So the kernel, kernel preservation is not that important, but I did mention that reduced silk feeding and that could uh, factor into our mycotoxin problems, aflatoxin and fumonisin here. And I think you guys have vomitoxin and fumonisin. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we talked about all of these toxins really being, they're coming from the same thing. The companies are cross licensing there and everything. On the top, we're showing cotton and first generation cotton's on the left. We're now on our third generation. But all this third generation really is, is we're taking an old toxin, adding another toxin, adding another toxin, all of the same toxins, and then sticking VIP on at the end. And that's what we have our state of the art in cotton now. It's just old toxins plus VIP. And you'll notice the same thing in corn. Um, here's the cotton here and corn below it. Cry ones, cry one F, cry two, VIP three A, same thing. And so, Really, these two crops are expressing the same toxins and selections going on the same way in the same pests that are common between the two crops. Which is why I mentioned uh, preservation of VIP is a big deal. And EPA has now gotten involved. They're pretty worried. All of the public sector entomologists are pretty worried. And so we know about VIP-3A resistance alleles, and that's David Kearns again and his group, and we're paying very close attention. Chris, you want to take this? Sure. So over the last couple of years, EPA has been re rethinking re resistance management for 
BP products. It started, they had a scientific advisory panel and they got that input and there's a back and forth kind of process that, that, that goes on. And it's allowed in, input from public sector entomologists like ourselves and industry and grower organizations as well. So within the last few months, EPA put out a, uh, a new plan for rethinking resistance management and the um, comments back for that were just due at the beginning of November. So one of the things in the plan is a new definition of resistance for these non-high dose LEPs. These used to be called the secondary LEPs, but certainly I think for most of you, you don't think that Western bean cutworm is secondary to your operation. It may indeed be your primary pest as it is for most of us in Michigan. So uh, it used to be that uh, the, the companies really didn't have to deal with these secondary or non-high dose LEPs, but as we've seen in, in earlier in this slide set, these are the, these are the, um, the species that are having the, a lot of the resistance issues. So at this point, what EPA would like to do is assume that all these non-high dose LEPs are uh, at heightened risk of resistance for old products and then for the newer products as well. So the old definition, old definition of resistance, uh, you know, for someone like me doing extension, it was very frustrating. The BT resistance in say, you have a field failure and we go out and we look at it, the BT resistance was confirmed only by lengthy laboratory assays, by collecting insects from the field, bringing them back to the lab, you know, having them mate, taking the, the larvae, putting them on artificial diet, seeing if they die. It was just a long process. And sometimes insects never got collected from failing fields, or you'd find out two years down the road what, what the results were. And that is not helpful if you're trying to deal with a field failure. So the new definition of resistance is that if we go to the field and we see unexpected injury, injury that just is abnormal, shouldn't be there, too many of the ears are fed on, that that will be then called practical resistance. And even though we don't know what's going on yet genetically, that it'll prompt some kind of remedial action, perhaps a spray, rotation, uh, what, whatever, whatever happens, something will be done within the field season and we won't wait. And we're trying to convince EPA <clears throat> to only mandate that spray, let's say, when it's practical to do it. Some of these pests, you can't spray them out anyway, so why spray? Right. And we're, we're working with them to help make this more reasonable. Another thing is, remember, they're supposed to phase out these single trait hybrids quite a while ago. And so for real, this time, they really want to have a phase out of single trait hybrids. And we hope it's sooner rather than later. Another thing that EPA has proposed, is kind of interesting, is a phase out of non-functional pyramids. Essentially, and, and they, they actually published a list of the pyramids which are essentially non-functional uh, for especially these secondary pests like Western bean cutworm or corn earworm. And essentially, on the list are all hybrids that do not have VIP. Now, here in Michigan or here in, in, in Ohio, Michigan, New York, Indiana, you know, a lot of these pyramids still work for us. You know, they, they, they not for Western bean, but for European corn borer. So to just visualize this, this is the handy BT trait table that Pat and I put together every year. And it lists all of the BT trait packages in alphabetical order. Now, of course, these are very tiny print and you can't see them, but just look at the vast number of trait packages that we have from different companies. If I take EPA's list of uh, what is a non-functional pyramid uh, on, the, on the right side of the screen, you see what would be left. Essentially, it'd be an AgriSure Viptera product, Leptra and Tricepta. Now, that, this is not likely to, to happen because a lot of our uh, pyramids still are functional for European corn borer, but it just shows you kind of um, how EPA is trying to, trying to think about some of this, how seriously that they're taking this resistance management. Um, and, uh, and here problem. in the South, <laughs> in the South, we're arguing to keep these old pyramids in because anything we can do to keep insects off VIP is a good thing. We've already lost those old trades. Why yeah, not so, throw that stuff? So again, this was just a proposal by e EPA, and uh, uh, but I don't think it's likely to happen in, in, that, in that way. 
No. A more interesting thing that they proposed was to increase the seed blend from the current 5% to 10% uh, na nationally. And what, at least from a Western Bean cutworm standpoint, uh, what we told EPA is that we thought that just throwing more refuge seeds into that seed blend is just a way to accelerate Western Bean cutworm resistance to VIP. Remember, the only toxin left that will control Western Bean cutworm, the only one is, is VIP. And it's essentially functioning as a single out there if you're growing a VIP hybrid. And remember, Western Bean cutworm is a mover. It goes from plant to plant. Uh, as it gets a little older, it's not killed by VIP to the same uh, to the same percentage. Uh, I just think it would be a disaster to throw extra refuge seeds into our seed blend. We'd we'd actually be better off with a block refuge for Western bean cutworm and 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 VIP rather than going to a ten percent blend. And you made that point very forcefully to EPA in your written comments, and I'm glad. Yes. You did. So in the Great Lakes region, what can you do to manage resistance at this point? Try to extend the life of the BTs that we have. So these are things that I just sort of came up with off the top of my head. One thing is uh, during planting and seed, seed selection, don't plant the single trait hybrids. I know I still have some of them in the Northern part of Michigan. I, I don't know where in Ohio you would have single trait still available, but where possible, you know, use the tank mix essentially of the, uh, of the, um, of the pyramids with two or more types of BT in there. And understand what, what you're planting. When you do have a BT pyramid, uh, you know, is it something that controls Western bee cutworm or not? What should you expect in the field when you plant this hybrid? What kind of damage should you expect if, if, if any? Pat and I produced the handy BT trait table and it is free on this link. If you search BT Trait Table Texas, it usually comes up in Google anyway, but the link is here. And that is just, you know, print it off, have it beside your computer. That's how I use it. And just make sure that when you're walking a field, you know what you've planted and what it's supposed to control. And something that I've thought about for a few years, and I know that Andy Michael has, has thought about this too, is, you know, if, if you're keen on thinking about non-BT or just planting a Roundup Ready, you know, maybe try it. I wouldn't put it on all your acres, but maybe try a, a field, uh, learn how to manage, uh, essentially manage corn without a, without, a, without a BT trait in it. I've, uh, over the years, I've talked to a number of growers who have started to do that. They're putting a field or two in non-BT and they're doing some learning, especially the younger growers who aren't as familiar with European corn borer. Uh, it, it's, it's a learning process to know how to scout what, what, the, what the damage looks like. But I almost think it's, a, it's just um, maybe a good thing to do because in the future, we may have more non-BT uh, forced upon us by these resistance issues because essentially our BTs will become not, not functional. And that reminds me that we've now put out a new edition of that 80 page European corn borer publication that was back from the fifties and we continue to improve it. And the new version is at Iowa State and it's uh, online and it's everything you'd ever wanna know about European corn borer, including right. scouting and thresholds. During the field season, you know, the only way that you know that moths are flying around, whether they're Western bean cutworm or Euro European corn borer, or even corn, corn earworm, is to trap to determine the population and time, time the uh, scouting. So, um, you know, if you're going to trap, you really got to look at weekly uh, tra trap counts to be able to compare week to week to see if the population is going up. And ideally, you should be trapping every year to know what's low and what's high. The public sector has a free uh, trapping network now. It's the Great Lakes and Maritimes uh, network that's run out of uh, Canada. It's free to all of us to access it and to put in data. And it's got data from Michigan and Ohio all the way over to the maritime provinces for multiple pests. So even if you don't trap, you can access this during the field season to find this. And then during the field season, I, I used to say, walk your non-BT fields and see what was happening. But now I'm recommending that 
you walk all your fields if you can. And I, I don't, even if you're not scouting in the traditional scouting, just the walking through and seeing what's going on. Th this is how our Western bean cutworm failures were discovered in 2016 and 2017, people walking fields in, in, in August. So if, even if you don't know, don't have the time to physically scout them, at least walk to uh, find larvae and damage in that August timeframe. And if you do see something wrong, report it immediately. Again, go back to your BT trait table, uh, say what, what should I, what should this uh, hybrid, what was it expected to control? <clears throat> and, and if there's additional damage, call somebody, call your seed dealer, call the extension agent, get us involved. Remember, it's a seed blend. So if you are in industry, it might, uh, it might make sense to start to carry the little quick strips here <clears throat> that are, uh, you know, because you're going to have some non-BT plants in there as well. So if you see damage, is that the non-BT refuge or is that something going wrong with your BT hybrid? So having these quick strips may be a very, very helpful thing. 